This moment in how local election officials handle these ballots. We want to live in a democracy where everyone possible is able to cast a ballot and have their voice heard. Every American citizen, once they've paid their debt to society, deserves to have that right restored to them immediately. College students have the power to make that change. It's our responsibility as citizens to be informed, to do the things that we need to do to ensure that we keep the republic. Today, we're looking at voting in multiple states. In Texas, we'll look at how we cast our ballots. Are there other ways for governments to create fair and efficient ways to vote? In Michigan, sticker pride. After you cast your ballot, what's with the stickers? What's the real point? In Florida, we're dissecting automatic voter registration. It's happening in many states. Could it become more prevalent? In Virginia, we'll take a look at the push to get students registered to vote on a college campus. In America, voting is your right, unless it's taken away. For many convicted felons, it happens. At the age of 15, I lost my voting rights before I had them. In some states, if you're a felon, you can never vote again. In other states, everyone can vote unless you're currently in prison. 
Some states restore the rights of felons automatically after completing a sentence, but in other states, it's not quite as simple. We're unpacking it all. I'm Lewis Bolden. This is Solutionaries. here today and I come to ask you to go all out to get every Negro in this county registered to vote. From Dr. Martin Luther King to Congressman John Lewis. Madam Speaker, you have heard me say on occasion that the right to vote is precious, almost sacred. The fight for voting rights has a strong history right here in Atlanta. We've had some of our greats, like John Lewis behind me, whose literal life was about making sure that everyone has access to the ballot, access to vote. If you see something that's not right, that's not just, you have an obligation to do something about it. And it's just as important today as ever before. Close elections, tight elections, Georgia has become a legitimate swing state where you never know which party is going to come out on top. This day and age, are we still having problems with people being registered to vote? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we have issues with maintaining accurate voter rolls and getting every eligible voter on the rolls. Uh, fundamental to voting rights is getting people on the voter rolls. We can throw a polling location on every corner, and if you're not on the voter rolls, you can't walk into that polling location and vote. The first step is to get on the voter rolls and to get registered. Which is where automatic voter registration, or AVR, makes a difference. Automatic voter registration started in 2016 in Georgia. It was done as an administrative decision. It was then Secretary of State Brian Kemp, the Attorney General's office, and the Department of Driver Services. They said, why don't we just start automatic voter registration? It'll perhaps prevent us from being sued and also re result in more accurate voter registration lists because people will have their information verified. Here's how AVR works, at least here in Georgia. Say you go to get a driver's license. Well, if you are eligible, the state will automatically register you to vote unless you specifically opt out. Same goes for if you are just moving here or if you change addresses. The result? Voting is at an all-time high. Since 2016, the number of registered voters has jumped by a million to 7.7 .7 million Georgians. And in the 2020 election, a record-breaking 66% of voters cast their ballots. The biggest growth? Among minorities, those in lower-income communities, and young people. So I'm James Wilson. I'm a student at Georgia State University. I'm Alex Ames. I'm a student at Georgia Tech. I'm Julian Fortuna. I'm a student at University of Georgia. What I see with AVR is that it gives people more confidence. They come in and they're not asking, am I registered to vote? Can you check my this? Can you check my that? They know they're registered to vote and they come in more confident because of that. We want to live in a democracy where everyone possible is able to cast a ballot and have their voice heard. It's how we end up with representation that doesn't frustrate people and doesn't vote in ways that we're like, how did this happen? This isn't what people want. Because of AVR, we have a huge number of our, a huge proportion of our population in Georgia registered to vote. Um, and and that, that does a lot of good, but unfortunately not, I don't think everyone wants to see that. There have been hiccups here, which caught the attention of the ACLU. Automatic voter registration was unfortunately removed in an administrative decision about a year ago. And for that year, we saw a significant drop off in the number of folks in Georgia who were able to get registered and get their registrations updated. So unfortunately, here in Georgia, voter suppression is still very, very real. State leaders blame a software glitch on the driver's services website. They tell us now it's been fixed. Does automatic voter registration help one party more than the other? It doesn't. It's just about your core ability to be on the voter rolls so that you can access your ballot and get your ballot counted. Regardless of what party you support, 
the primary way that Georgians have been able to get registered and to get their registrations updated has been automatic voter registration. 20 states and D.C. have approved AVR, saying it not only brings more voters, it catches duplicate registrations and saves taxpayers money. Automatic voter registration, no matter who you ask and what party, you'll get different views on it, but I don't think you can dispute that it has expanded voting opportunities and access and accuracy. What are the cons to AVR? When you look at the cons to having automatic voter registration, there's none. There's simply none. Any argument that could come up against automatic voter registra registration is not strong enough because the point of the matter is everyone has the right to vote. One day, Georgia will be a better state. And that, activists say, is walking in the footsteps of giants. When you go to vote, you expect to see crisp pieces of paper, the names of candidates listed in order, races and issues neatly fit into boxes and clearly separated. Also, all of it easy to read and see. But what about in a language you speak? And what if that language isn't English? Turns out it's actually federal law that we have to print ballots in other languages. According to the Voting Rights Act, if a place has more than 5% of their voters or more than 10,000 voters who speak a language that isn't English, they're required to print ballots in that other language. And that comes out to a lot of people. According to the last census, more than 24.2 million people lived in places where they needed to have ballots in a language that those people spoke. And those ballots span languages from more than 30 countries and across five continents. While it seems like a no-brainer to print these ballots in a language that isn't English, it's been an uphill battle for decades. In Florida, which is one of the most consequential states for elections and has the third highest population of Spanish speakers, counties just agreed this year to print ballots in Spanish. That's more than 4 million people with the new access to vote. And in Michigan, with the highest population of Arabic speakers, people are still fighting to get Arabic on their ballots. But maybe the biggest thing isn't the translation, but what it says about who we think should and shouldn't be able to vote. Election experts have said for years that breaking the language barrier is the easiest way to get more people to vote. And in the end, isn't that what we want? More Americans voting, making their voices heard, no matter what language that voice is in. Nationwide, we've had a lot of more discussion. Elections and voting have become very politicized in a way that they just haven't been in a long time in America. Election officials should be working to stop potential mail ballot fraud. And those forces are at play in Texas as they are everywhere else. Voting rights versus election security, a controversial topic picking up steam in Texas. So SB1 was the voting law that passed in Texas last fall. And what we're seeing, unfortunately, is that the law is making it more difficult for people to vote. We want to get to NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton. On the Democratic side, a lot of the voters that I've talked to here tonight are really concerned about voting rights. They're concerned about SB1 and the changes to the election. Certainly there has been confusion around mail-in ballots. For example, um, people have had lots of issues with their mail ballot applications being flagged. This was not an issue that we had in previous elections. How did you feel when you, you, know, you saw that final 20% rejection rate, <coughs> you know, after years of when you have like 2 to 3%? It's tough. It, it, it's tough that um, that's not who we are. So many people are having their ballots flagged because the new law imposes requirements. Mail ballot envelopes now need to have the voter's state ID number or the last four of their social on the outside of the envelope. In this spot, under the flap. 
It's a spot some missed entirely. In particular, I spoke to older voters who were talking about challenges with mail-in voting. Now that the law required people to submit identification numbers that had to match what they sent in when they first registered to vote, which has proved to be very challenging. Hey, I just got this uh, letter handed to me. This is from Secretary of State, Secretary of State John Scott, who says that the uh, delay in Harris County voting, that the votes will not be tabulated by uh, tomorrow. Once again, there's some sort of election ballot issue in Harris County. We have both party chairs. They're completely frustrated. And yet, on a typical night, you're telling the state you're not going to be able to count all the votes by 7 p.m. Harris County has never said that we're not able to return results over tomorrow night. We had a meeting earlier with the Republican and Democratic parties and the Secretary of State. Those parties were nervous because of the new legal implementations, the civil, uh, the civil, sorry, penalties that could be excised upon them. They said, we're nervous with SB1. Senate Bill 1 weaponizes, right, weaponizes all these claims, even these 30-year-old kind of mundane, outdated laws. We're scared to violate that because we as presiding judges, but are we going to jail? Tomorrow morning, we still may not know the results. All eyes are on Texas right now. Yeah. We're the first primary in the nation, so this definitely is a high-profile mess up. We're in a, a crisis moment in how local election officials handle these ballots, and the harder it is to convince people that it's being done well. I mean, we're here to facilitate this and get every voter, and we've built up relationships with so many of these people over the years. Um, so, like I said, we're, we're working it, we're working it, and uh, with your help, we're going to get there. Just because you get convicted of a felon doesn't make you any less of a human being. I was young and pretty much just made some bad decisions. At the age of 15, I lost my voter rights before I had them. I think that we're still living in an era of Jim Crow, no matter how you put it. Every American citizen, once they've paid their debt to society, deserves to have that right restored to them immediately. My name is Desmond Mead, and I am the Executive Director of Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. FRC is an organization led by directly impacted people, or people with previous felony convictions, as well as family members who have loved ones that have been impacted by the justice system. To tell someone that in spite of the fact that you served your time and paid your debt to society, that you should not have a say in how your community or state or country is ran. It was something wrong with that. It makes you feel like you're no longer an American. It sounds to me like they're trying to suppress convicted felons, which are human beings, just like you or him. And everybody's got a right. You know, you want to talk about a moment? You want, to talk, you want to talk about my wife, Sheena, running for office. Uh, she ran for House District 46, right, getting all excited about it. And weeks before the primary election, you know, and someone approached me and said, Desmond, I know you're excited that you're going to get the vote for your wife, right? And it was like they took a knife and just stuck it in an old wound and twisted it, reminding me, right, that I'm not even good enough to vote for my wife. is that it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, uh, it doesn't matter what background you come from, all of us believe in democracy. From the very beginning, right, I knew that this issue was more than just an African American issue. It was more than just a, a, a Democrat versus Republican issue. That this was an all American issue. Let's go to election night. 64% of the vote? 64, I won't say 65. More than 64, yeah. Yeah, let's say let's round up, right? 65%. When you saw that final vote tally? I was, ooh, Jesus Lord, I was, I was just, I was blown away. We're celebrating this moment. We're celebrating the love that got us here. <laughs> yes, I feel free. I feel like, a, I feel like a 
full citizen. Um, as a state attorney, I mean, all the um, numbers and statistics support people who are more engaged civically are less likely to commit crime. I thought once I had made a mistake that I would never be able to do that or even have a decision in anything anymore. After we passed Amendment 4, the politics came in. That's a different conversation. We didn't believe that any American citizen should have to choose between putting food on their table or being able to vote, paying their rent or mortgage or being able to vote, right? And, and what we found was that even those, those, a lot of those fines or, or legal financial obligations were also attached to their driver's license being suspended, right? And, and, and so it was like a double whammy. I'm like, I'm blocking you from... Uh, 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 participating in democracy, and I'm also blocking you from fully engaging in our economy. If I'm going out to register people to vote, I'm not trying to register more Democrats. I'm not trying to register more Republicans. You know what I'm trying to register? More investors in our democracy. I want you to invest in our democracy. Whether you think like me or not, your participation is an investment in it, and the more people we have investing in it, the more vibrant it is, and everyone benefits. If I send my ballot in and something's wrong with it and it gets rejected, will somebody reach out to me and let me know that that's the case? So let's get some questions answered about um, what voters should be aware of. First question, and the basic one is, who is eligible to vote? Any United States citizen who's 18 years old in every state across the nation. In Texas in particular, you have to have resided in the county for 30 days and been a resident of Texas for 30 days and not be mentally incompetent. And you can actually be confined you could register if you're in jail as long as you haven't been convicted of a felony. What do voters need to bring to the polls? Voters need to bring some form of identification to the polling place and it would be a good idea to bring their voters registration certificate that they get in the mail after they register to vote because it has valuable information on it. What is the status now on how to get a mail-in ballot. Can everybody do that or how does that work? Very specific rules for getting a vote by mail application. You need to be at least 65 years old, uh, you disabled, you're pregnant and you're gonna give birth within three weeks before the election or three weeks after. You're out of state during the entire election period or if you're in jail but you haven't been convicted. So many people are having their ballots flagged because the new law imposes requirements that people write on their application, either their driver's license or their social security number, whichever they used to register to vote in the first place. So if you registered to vote 20 years ago in Harris County, if you registered to vote 18 months ago in Harris County, you may not remember whether you used your driver's license or your social security number. We're asking for both numbers because then we stand a better chance, depending on which one we have on file. The development of the ballot, when they redesigned, this is called a carrier envelope, mm -hmm. and this is what makes everything work. The voter puts their ballot in, in the secrecy envelope, then they seal it, and as I said, for years, this has been the back of the ballot. Find the red X, and it says, sign over the flap. And that's for their protection, because then we can see if anybody's opened it sort of they'll mess up their signature. And the voters have been doing this for years and years and years. So I can see how it was easy to miss this. If the actual ballot does not arrive, if arrive in time 
there is a possibility that the election officials may reach out to you to cure the ballot, that you can make, if there are things wrong with it, that they can fix it. A follow-up to that, if I send my ballot in and something's wrong with it and it gets rejected, mm -hmm. will somebody reach out to me and let me know that that's the case? They may reach out to you if there's adequate time, but it's not required by law that they do. Here in Harris County, the county clerk has been very vigilant about following up with voters. Yeah. Hello, my dad. Doing? The county clerk will help you um, call them back, write them back, try again um, to to get that information synced up so that you can vote by mail. So um, we run the one eight six six R vote hotline. We staff it with lawyers. We run it together as the ACLU of Texas with the Texas Civil Rights Project, Common Cause, the League of Women Voters. So what we try to do is give the voter information that empowers them to cast their ballot right then. But before you do that, do your research. Go to vote for one one or the League of Women Voters Voters Guide webpage to find out who are the candidates on the ballot for your respective area so you can make a decision. Kind of like Benjamin Franklin said, ma'am, we created a republic if you can keep it. And so it's our responsibility as citizens to be informed, to do the things that we need to do to ensure that we keep the republic. Disinformation uh, definitely has led to deaths. I'm Fergus Bell. I'm the founder and CEO of Fathom. We work with news organizations and journalists around the world to help them be prepared to counter mis and disinformation. Misinformation is uh, something that is unintentionally shared or unintentionally put out there into the world. It could be something as simple as a mistake that someone has made that just ends up getting gaining some traction, uh, or it could be um, something being misread or shared out of context. Disinformation is uh, are things that are wrong that are shared intentionally. So there is intent behind the actions. And that's where you would see a disinformation campaign, something that is targeted by bad actors towards a certain group of people or towards a certain organization with a specific outcome in mind. The reason why misinformation can turn into disinformation is because uh, if it's being shared and there's some kind of something that people are grabbing onto, uh, some, some reason why this is an interesting thing to people or, or there's something entertaining about it and it means it's going to be shared. Disinformation campaigns have been used to disrupt election processes all around the world. In 2016, uh, it was uh, used in the US. Uh, we know that there is evidence of that. Uh, we have found the, the social posts. They are designed to sow doubt or they are designed to uh, create situations where people are pitched against each other. It's got to be something that's a little bit more vague that people can't quite latch onto to say whether this is true or not true. There's always a kernel of truth, or there's often a kernel of truth in a disinformation campaign, certainly in, in misinformation. Um, it's because there, it helps with that, with that spreading. If you are a regular person, uh, you, might, you might think, well, I've heard that before, or yes, I remember that. And you might not know where, and you might not know the exact detail, but that is enough that might uh, allow someone to feel more comfortable sharing it. And that's how it works. Disinformation uh, definitely has led to deaths um, in, in many parts of the world. We've seen there's definitely cases in, in Asia where we've seen disinformation campaigns have led to uh, lynchings of people. Um, we've seen the same in, in Africa. Uh, we've also seen disinformation campaigns in in other places in the world where we where we've seen uh, democracy be disrupted, uh, the intent there is to is to disrupt an election. So it's dangerous in terms of democracy. It's dangerous in terms of people's lives.
the first thing you want to do is check the source. Check who who shared this, where you're seeing it, uh, and then you're able to identify potentially why someone might be uh, sharing that or creating it. So you might see intent. You should check some the the history of the person sharing this, uh, or the person who's who's written this or or created it. Uh, that will also then give you some indication of intent and, and motive. You should look at whether you can identify your own uh, disinformation campaign by doing the, the technique of copying and pasting and putting it back onto a network. You then see similar language or, or even exact phrases being shared over and over again. And that might mean that it's a concerted effort. I would say the final thing to do is also not assume that everything is missing disinformation. The majority that you're seeing is is not it's it's genuine content um and so you should be alert you should be kind of smart in the way that you accept uh, you access it and you should really uh have a diversity in sources so don't just follow uh, accounts that you agree with don't allow an algorithm to serve you content that you would only find interesting if you're seeing things on social media look for sources outside of social media I know that college students have the power to make that change. And I know that students like that exist on every campus. students can register to vote at home or where they go to school. Vote.org says the choice is legally yours. You have dual residency, so you can register back home or on campus as long as you don't register to vote in both states. A college student votes in the same manner as any other registered voter in person on Election Day or if eligible by absentee. Now, if you register to vote back home, you'll need to remember to sign up for an absentee ballot. But vote.org says students with scholarships or tuition that require residency should check with their financial aid office before registering to vote back home. For example, if you have a scholarship that requires California residency, you should ensure that registering to vote in a different state will not affect your status. I did it, but I was Can I pet your dog? Yeah. <laughs> what is this for? Um, so I'm with VT Engage, which is the Center for Leadership and Service Learning, and basically we're doing some voter education today. It's great talking it's to you guys. To My name is Maya Mehdi. I'm the director of Hokies Vote Caucus. If you use this QR code, you can put in your address and it will tell you what representatives are up for election. I've always been really passionate about voting rights specifically. Both my parents are Syrian immigrants, so I was always raised around this culture of, you know, how awesome democracy is and how it really is a beautiful thing to have your voice valued and to um, speak up and to empower the people around you. <laughs> um, you have a second to talk about voting by any chance? Um, sure. Um, so, College students uh, have been Hokies at the Vote forefront Caucus, of political activism since forever. Um, you know, UC Berkeley is a huge hub of political activity. It's where the disability rights movement started and where it continues to this day. And so I know that college students have the power to make that change. And I know that students like that exist on every campus. I'm Beth Obenchain. I'm a board member of the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County. So we're fortunate tonight to have Dr. Brandy Faulkner as our moderator. Thank you so much. Am I coming through okay? Is my sound good? But that's one of the purposes of our program tonight is to have two women who've had been on the Board of Supervisors and the City Council who've been very active in local elected positions to talk specifically about how they became involved. What's your first step before you sign up to run for Congress? The first political uh, 
I guess feeling I ever had was in fourth grade. I do have a voice. I do have something to say. If you don't have a seat at the table, you might be on the menu for lunch. What we're trying to do is get our audience tonight and in the future to think about what are those first steps you can take locally to become involved because that is so important. And of course, if they start to do that, then they will vote on the local elections and be, again, much more knowledgeable of issues. The voter turnout and the voter registration that's come from the Virginia Tech campus is incredible compared to other colleges. Why is that? I think you're seeing a, a group of students that are motivated. You know, we have Ut Prosum as the university motto, and so wanting to make social change in their communities and realizing that this is one of the ways um, that they're able to do that. I'm Jess Davis. I'm the Assistant Director for Leadership and Civic Engagement in VT Engage, the Center for Leadership and Service Learning. I think we're seeing a lot more divisiveness in society broadly. Um, there's a lot of myths and disinformation that is out there, and so this allows students to come together, have a conversation about a topic, and really kind of walk away and think through, like, what does this mean for my community? Because we also know that solutions look different for every community, right? It's not going to be the same, and so how can we talk through what those look like for our community here? What are some of the limitations? What do you run into when you're trying to educate students on voting rights? Yeah. Um, you know, I think probably the biggest limitation to students voting is really that time piece, right? And I don't think it's different for any other person too, right? But we know our college students are taking classes, they are holding part-time jobs, some of them might be full-time jobs, right? They have all these other things that are happening in their lives, and so um, carving out that time can sometimes be difficult, um, particularly when I think about our first-year voters, right? Like, there's nothing like going to the polling place on election day. You're going, you're getting uh, your, your ballot, you fill it out, you get your sticker. Um, I think it's a really exciting time and so we're seeing a lot more of our students wanting to wait rather than do early voting options so that they can have that experience. Um, and so sometimes you're like, oh man, I have a big test coming up, right? Like th things happen and, and we see that time and time again. And so um, we want to make voting more fun so that we can think about like what are some of those early voting pieces that we can make that just as fun and exciting as what it looks like on election day registrars in Virginia in this area made it very hard for college students to vote. Uh, they only wanted them to vote where their parents lived. Uh, and so uh, the biggest change we've seen is students can now choose. Do we want to vote on campus? Do we want to vote here? Or perhaps we know the candidates and the issues a little better in our hometown, whether it's Northern Virginia or Harrisonburg. So, so that's been a great improvement. And something unique to Virginia Tech is there's actually a voting precinct on campus. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Since the 2016 election, they've been voting in the Squire Student Center. And so if students are registered to vote here on campus, they're able to use that precinct to vote. And so it's a pretty fun time. The, the entire ballroom is kind of decked out in people um, for the precinct to be able to cast their ballots. How were you able to get the whole campus to rally around this? Well, I mean, I think asking people to register to vote is a pretty easy thing to rally around. I think it's one of those rights that we have as a citizen that we want to exercise. But I think the important piece too is that we really have support from top down. It's really exciting and great to see a new generation kind of coming up and, and having that excitement. One of the things we want is for college students and younger voters to realize that they are a powerful block. If they just get together and register and believe that their vote matters, they could have a huge impact. I feel like voting is a first step and then you can push people to really um, be activists and be the person to take that first step to make the change they want to see. So. They come in all shapes and sizes and quality. They've been around for decades, but why do we start using these little stickers and where do they come from? Voting, 
It's one of the most American things we do every two years. The peaceful transfer of power, democracy in action, the voices of the people heard in the solemn rite of civic duty. At no time before have voters faced a clearer choice. The right to vote and have that vote counted is democracy's threshold liberty. Yeah, 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 but we know what we're really here for. These little guys. Hey. Ooh. This is what we came for. Justin? You want to? Yeah. yeah. They're coveted. They're colorful. They come in all shapes and sizes and quality, and they're definitely a flex in an election selfie. They've been around for decades, but why do we start using these little stickers and where do they come from? Those little stickers actually have their roots in the 1800s, when voting wasn't a secret and cities and towns threw huge parties to get people to turn out. Eligible men would grow election beards or mustaches just to show off they were old enough to vote. It's your civic duty. One historian told Time Magazine it was the State Fair, the 4th of July, and Christmas Day all wrapped into one. The rule was you had to be a man of ordinary courage uh, to vote, and that meant shouldering through uh, crowds of raucous, drunken other voters who often came, you know, early to, to and often the night before to, to, you know, stake out their claim. That's Donald Green, a political science professor at Columbia University. In 2016, he did a study looking at how reviving that same kind of festival atmosphere could make turnout higher. You would vote in public. You would typically vote with a colored ballot that will indicate the party of your choice. And you had to set it on the public ballot box to the booze and chairs of, uh, of people around you and then stick it in and you know up until to that point um, you were being plied with uh, whiskey from you know one or both parties yeah that's right the i voted sticker of the 19th century was whiskey the amount of booze that was consumed on election day was truly fabulous and in new york city for example apparently 90 percent of the voting locations were in saloons uh in the 1860s which is part of the reason why it was difficult for victorian era women to get the vote because it was associated with Drinking. But as the 1900s came and reformers of both the temperance movement and the progressives like President Teddy Roosevelt wanted to shift away from party machines and more towards elections about the issues, it had the side effect of turning elections into much more solemn days. By the 1920s, everyone, the Boy Scouts, civic leaders, everybody is bemoaning the fact that turnout has fallen from roughly 80% to under 50%. And things stayed pretty much the same until the 1980s, when we first see those little red and blue stickers. The first mention of one is in the Miami Herald in 1982. A few years later, the Phoenix Realtors Association started giving them out in Maricopa County. Then in 1987, the election supply company, Intab, claims they started selling their iconic stickers, you know, the ones with the waving American flag on them. But do they really work? Does getting a sorta sticky piece of paper actually make people want to vote? You know, my sense is that um, they, in some sense, reward people who are already highly mo motivated to vote. And the hope is that as those people swagger around with their I voted sticker, other people will be similarly motivated. So in some sense, it all depends on whether they're walking around with their stickers proudly displayed. Um, if it's a cold November and the sticker is on the, the sweater, but the overcoat is over the sweater, you know, it's a, it's a zero. Or is the answer to making elections fun again? You could have a festival on a weekend, you could have a concert, you could have a whatever. Um, and, you know, the idea of bringing back brass bands, marching bands, school performances, you know, that was sort of a thing. But for now, these are, well, what we're stuck with. We'd like to hear what you think about the topic. Leave us a comment below and be sure to subscribe to our Solutionaries channel. We're just getting started.